Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Meditate 2021. Uh, my name is James Lynch, and I'm so glad to have you all here today. Um, we're not going to be able to live stream on Facebook for those people who are going to see this video later. There were some technological difficulties. But before we begin, I'd like to have Venerable Dhamma Jodi of the Village of Ahara and also the treasurer of the Buddhist Council of New York start us off with a prayer. Thank you so much, Venerable Dhamma Jodi. Bhante. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I am Alujama Dhamma Jyoti from New York Buddhist Vihara. And I'm going to bless all of you by the power of Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and by the power of all the deities, gods who protect this world. May you be well, happy, and peace. May you have courage, patience, understanding, and determination to overcome failures in your life. May all you, may all we attain ultimate bliss of Nibbana, having that aspiration, I'm going to bless all of you and all living beings. Sadhu, 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 Namu Tas Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sambuddhas Namu tas bhagavatu arahatu samma sambuddhas. Namu tas bhagavatu arahatu samma sambuddhas. First, I respect to the Buddha who is fully enlightened one. Sabbiti yo vivajang tu sabrogo vinasatu mate bhavatvantara yo suki di gayuko bhav bhavatu sabb mangalang rakhantu sabb devata sabb buddha nubhavin sada sotti bhavantu te Bhavatu sabb mangalang rakhantu sabb devata sabb dhamma nubhavin sada sotti bhavantu te Bhavatu sabb mangalang rakhantu sabb devata sabb sangha nubhavin sada sotti bhavantu te let those who are in misery be free from misery. Let those who are in fear, agony, and insecurity be free from fear, agony, and insecurity. Let those who are in sorrow be free from sorrow. And may all living beings be well, happy, and peace. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Venerable Dhamma Jodi. I know people, <laughs> thank you again. I know so many people here in the background. My neighbor is actually having his um, lawn done right now, <laughs> but it's all right. Hopefully, he'll stop. I want to again say um, good afternoon to everybody and welcome to today's gathering of joy concerning Meditate NYC 2021. Uh, my name again is James Lynch, and I'm the current president of the Buddhist Council of New York. Arisha Kosakai practitioner on behalf of the Buddhist Council of New York. I welcome all of you with a heart of compassion, joy, and hope to meditate NYC 2021 with the theme of raising the lotus. No mud, no lotus, like the sound behind me. <laughs> First, I wanna thank all the speakers who sent videos to the council and who are speaking live today for their willingness to share their compassion and love of the Dharma with all of us in these extremely difficult times. Some of you immediately responded to my request for videos, even while you were on retreat in Taiwan and followed up with me to make sure that you would be included today. And so I say, thank you. I also wanna thank all of the people 
the tireless workers on the council who work behind the scenes on the council to make this day a success, despite surgeries to their shoulders, tooth extractions, root canals, and crazy schedules, you have gone above and beyond in making this day, Meditate 2021, a special day. Of that group, I do want to take a moment to thank Sylvia Sun, who works tirelessly behind the scenes, who is always there making sure that we are on the right path. And so Sylvia, I say thank you. You didn't know that, but I'm going to say thank you. And so this year's Meditate 2021 event starts off with thanks and also thanks and gratitude to all of you for making it through this challenging time. And it is with you in mind that this year's theme was formulated. Indeed, the theme of raising the lotus with a sub theme as provided by Thich Nhat Hanh of No Mud, No Lotus has deep significance. I just wanna mention three powers of the lotus which refer directly to you and your determination to continue on in sharing the Dharma during these challenging times. First, the Lotus Sutra represents enlightenment. For regardless of its dirty environment and muddy water in which it is rooted, the Lotus flower skillfully rises above it all to bloom in beauty facing the sun and like you continues to rise. Second, the Lotus flower also represents new beginnings. The flower emerges in the morning only to faithfully close up at night and then disappears back into the water. And yet in the morning, a new blossom reemerges and continues the cycle. You like that cycle are emerging to face the new day post COVID and a new sunrise. And finally for today, thirdly, the lotus flower sheds its seeds and blossoms at the same time. For Buddhists, it represents the principle of cause and effect, wherein every action or thought is believed to cause an effect that can be experienced either now or in the future and reveals the power of every encounter that we have in our lives. Nothing is meaningless and that we are all a part of the great life force of the universe. And you by your great compassion for others are changing our world. So Meditate NYC, New York City 2021, is presented with these key elements of the lotus in mind, that regardless of the challenges that confront us, we shall rise above them with beauty, compassion, and joy. Two, that this day today, this precious moment represents a new beginning and that we through our actions determine our future. And three, that the wonderful causes that we create today immediately begin to change our world into the land of tranquil life. So in pre preparation for today, I've been praying daily and asking the Buddha that we might leave here today by continuing to be more than mere observers to ongoing occurrences in our world, that we remember our worldly area of mud and desire and confusion can be turned around and transformed by our hands into love and renewal for all. I know that based upon the Buddha Dharma that we are here for a reason and that we do make a difference. And I also believe that we in the Buddhist community and the Buddhist Council of New York must take a far more prominent role in New York City life going forward. Indeed, everywhere I go in New York City and the larger metropolitan community, people are always asking for you. They want your kindness, your insight, your skill in healing our world in order to move forward. Again, let me say it, our communities need your beautiful presence and as we help others, we also must remember that no Dharma center, temple, or Buddhist meditation hall should ever suffer alone. The council is here to help you. Please never forget that. We are here for you. Next, let me briefly recount the no mud, no lotus activities that the council has taken on during this time of the pandemic. We have addressed, hopefully skillfully, police misconduct address ongoing violence in the black community, reducing on gun violence here in New York City. We have initiated and participated in interreligious dialogues, proper census 2020 counting and its importance, thanks to Venerable Nakagaki, protection of voting rights, feeding the hungry through pantry support here in New York City, private conversations with city and police officials on the need for communities to be treated with dignity, all communities, vigorous immigration rights support, an increased emphasis on mental health, 
standing for the proper treatment and recognition of nuns and those who self-identify as female in the Buddhist communities, the elevation of black, brown, and indigenous people in Buddhist communities, standing firm against the rampant and ongoing attacks against Asians, uncompromising stands for peace as opposed to tolerance for the default of war, standing for the proper sexual conduct in our temples, Dharma centers, and beyond, the advocacy for the humane treatment of prisoners, as well as the affirmative advocacy for the closing of inhumane prisons in New York City, like Rikers Island, and creating from scratch the New York Peace Team dedicated to nonviolent engagement in every level of society with a current emphasis on the young through international organizational partnerships like with the Arigato Society with its emphasis on supporting child empowerment and stopping their economic and sexual exploitation of children everywhere. And so with this as the backdrop, I want you to know that thanks to you, the council has set its sights and efforts to speak directly to the cries of marginalized communities and for those who have been systematically ignored. But to do so in a way that is transformative and empowering for those communities themselves based upon fundamental Buddhist principles of putting others first. A new culture of peace that includes making sure that we have recognized Vesak holiday and it's important and yes, it will happen thanks to your sincere efforts. Finally, I think that Meditate NYC is extremely important because it gives the Buddhist community from different traditions a chance to move together with a renewed sense of hope for the possibilities of better days, knowing that we will be successful. This day also makes sure that each and every one of you knows how important you are to this city, to this country, and to this world. And this knowing is crucial for all of our happiness. Again, each of you is a lighthouse. And the lighthouse often doesn't know just how many ships that a tiny beam of light from it will stop a ship from crashing into disaster. Lastly, as the Buddha recommends, let us make ourselves the light and the truth the light. And listening to the Buddha's sacred directive, let that light be a hopeful light for others. Let us pray that the Buddha, whom we devoutly revere, the Buddha's bodhisattvas and countless heavenly beings who are omnipresent in the 10 directions, will watch over our peaceful steps today in whatever way they can and extend their hands of compassion and guidance and back and forth peace in our local areas our various countries and in our world. We also pray that the world of all living beings will find peace. Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, James Lynch, the current president of the Buddhist Council of New York, I have respectfully offered these words of hope. And with that, let's begin our presentation. Thank you so much.
Namo Buddhaya. My name is Bhikkhu Bodhi, and I am speaking now from Zhuangyan Buddhist Monastery in Carmel, New York. For the members of the New York Buddhist Council, I want to offer a few words of reflection as our country starts to emerge from the COVID pandemic. I think there are two valuable lessons that we can learn from this pandemic, two lessons that we should that we should take to heart. One of these is the need to respect scientific truth, to respect objective truth. At present, here in the United States, 750,000 people have died from COVID. And one of the reasons why the pandemic has taken such a high toll here in the United States is because people have not been ready to listen to the words of the scientific authorities, the medical authorities, but instead have been bombarded with misinformation and disinformation. We've been told that the virus is nothing more than the common cold that is going to come and within a few weeks or a month it will be gone that there's no need to observe any precautions. And because of this, the virus has found hosts in human bodies and has spread all over the country from region to region, causing so many deaths, so much grief and sorrow among so many families. So the first lesson, we have to be willing to face the truth, accept the truth, and learn the truth from reliable sources of information, not from social media, not from certain TV channels in which the commentators have a, you could say, an underlying political motivation. And then the second lesson that we should adopt is to act with social responsibility. Because we've been bombarded by misinformation, too many people have been going around without masks not observing physical distancing, not getting the vaccination, not getting the vaccine. And now that the vaccine is available, unless one has some medical condition that makes the vac vaccination risky, you should definitely take the vaccine. This is done to fulfill our responsibility to others so that we don't become a channel for transmitting the virus to others and also to protect ourselves so that we don't pick up the virus that others might be carrying. We can say that these two lessons represent the twin aspects of wisdom and compassion to respect the truth and listen to the words of the qualified authorities on medical issues. And when we act in a socially responsible way, we're doing, some, we're doing so out of compassion for others in order to protect the lives and well-being of others. If any of you who are listening have lost loved ones during this time of the pandemic, I extend to you my deepest sympathies, and I hope we will all emerge from this pandemic strengthened in our determination to follow the Buddha's teaching. Thank you all for listening, and may the blessings of the Triple Gem be with you all. Hello. Good day to all of you members and participants in our annual New York Buddhist Council Meditate New York City. My name is Inke O'Hara, and I'm the abbot of the village Zendo in New York City. Our Soto Zen Buddhist community began in 1985 as a group of New Yorkers who wanted to meditate and practice together. From the onset, our community has been dedicated to Zen Buddhist practice and social engagement. Being a Buddhist community located in the heart of the city, our practice embraces all the muddy parts that arise around us. What is that mud in the city? 
Isn't it the suffering caused by poverty, by anger, by ignorance? Indeed, our ideals and our feelings can seem to turn to mud when we look directly at the suffering lives of so many in our city. This calls to mind the great teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, who wrote of the beautiful lotus flower, a symbol of enlightenment, of love, and beauty. Master Nhat Hanh reminds us that the beautiful lotus only grows in the mud, in what we think of as suffering, as bad, as something to turn away from in fear, to ignore. But he says, and I'm quoting him now, without mud, there can be no lotus. It is possible, of course, to get stuck in the mud of life. The hardest thing to practice is not allowing yourself to be overwhelmed by despair. When you're overwhelmed by despair, all you can see is suffering everywhere you look. You feel as if the worst thing is happening to you. But we must remember that suffering is a kind of mud that we need in order to generate joy and happiness. We have to learn how to embrace and cradle our own suffering and the suffering of the world with a lot of tenderness. I would ask us all here in New York today, can we as Buddhists take this message of the venerable Thich Nhat Hanh and take this message to our heart? And when we're faced with the suffering of those in our city, can we find a way to support them? To support the one in 10 students who are homeless? The 16% of New Yorkers who live in poverty? The 500,000 undocumented alien immigrants in our city? This is the mud. And we are the lotus. We can blossom by offering what we can, support, financial support, physical support, just standing next to someone in need, food, housing, access to legal and medical practitioners, and also understanding and care and love. So I offer this as a challenge to us all. We need to step up in our communities, in our sanghas, in our congregations, and educate ourselves about the conditions of our neighborhoods, and then we must act. We must find a way to be of service. That is the whole of the Dharma. It is not to sit comfortably and philosophize, but it is to take action and serve the action around us. I am hoping these humble words that I'm offering you today will encourage you and motivate you to take new actions in our communities, to find new ways to serve the well-being of all of life. May we all blossom in this muddy New York pond. Thank you for your practice, and please be well. In the fall of 1991, Venerable Master Xing Yun led a group of respected monastics to the eastern United States to preach the Dharma. On a quiet block in the fleshy neighborhood of Queens, New York, they found and purchased a 20,000-foot, five-story building. After renovation, the New York branch of the International Buddhist Progress Society, or IBPS, officially opened in 1993. The temple has a dedicated parking lot and is convenient to buses, subways, and trains within and to New York. When one enters IBPS New York, to the left of the lobby are a welcome center and the water drop tea house. Within the information center, one finds shelves of neatly arranged books on Buddhism, biographies of eminent monastics, Tripitaka or Buddha scriptures, and various media, as well as majestic statues of the Buddha, artisanal handicrafts, and accessories such as pendants. The Water Drop Tea House is named after the Venerable Master's words of thanks to his teacher. A drop of water shall be returned with a burst of spring. Disciples and visitors can take time from their busy lives to relax and enjoy delicious vegetarian meals, coffees, and other refreshments. 
the tea house is a calm place to nurture leisure and a sense of community. On the second floor is a Tathagata Hall, where 200 people can gather to participate in recitals and prayer. The third floor is the Guan Yin Hall, which has 200 seats and is both a library and a lecture hall to hear Buddhist scriptures. The fourth floor holds a children's library and multi-purpose classrooms for Chinese school, Buddhist light scout trips, and other youth activities. In the basement, one finds a cafeteria which serves 200 people. Venerable Master Xingyun advocates humanistic Buddhism, which affirms that Buddha was of this human world. It was where he was born, where he cultivated himself, where he was enlightened, and where he taught. Therefore, disciples of humanistic Buddhism follow Buddha's example and engage themselves in the human world. IBPS New York adheres to and promotes the four principles of humanistic Buddhism. Promote Buddhism through culture. Spreading the teachings of Buddhism to benefit people's lives through Buddhist bookstores, libraries, literature offices, and broadcast media. Cultivate talent through education. Educating and uplifting people and communities through the establishment of Buddhist colleges, schools, classes, and Buddhist light scout troops. Giving back to society through acts of service, helping those who are in disadvantaged circumstances, elderly or affected by disasters through aid, relief, and our time and presence. Purify people's hearts through cultivation and practice, holding various Buddhist rituals and activities such as resetting mantras, meditation practices, and the eight precepts. For almost 30 years, IBPS New York has led Venerable Master Xingyun's mission to advance humanistic Buddhism so that the Buddhist light may shine on 3,000 realms and the Dharma stream will flow across all five continents. Hello, in Tashi Delay. Welcome to Meditate NYC. My name is Trey Ligon and I'm President and Director of Dharmakaya Buddhist Center. We are located in the Reno Lake Tahoe area of Nevada. We've been a Dharma Center for over a decade and offer classes, teachings, and study groups and meditations. The center is run by volunteers dedicated to providing an educational experience through which minds and hearts can be transformed into the highest potential for all benefit of sentient beings. As with most centers, we have moved to a hybrid teaching schedule this year. We offer both Zoom and in-person events. We are affiliated with the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition, which is an international organization founded in 1975 by Lama Zopa Rinpoche and Lama Thupten Yeshe. FPMT is grounded in the Galupa tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, the spiritual tradition of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The Foundation is devoted to the transmission of the Mahayana Buddhist values worldwide through education, meditation, and community service. I'm very happy to be here by Zoom for this year's Raising the Lotus event. And I would like to offer a prayer for this event that I think is relevant today as it was in the eighth century by Master Shanti Deva, the Indian philosopher, monk, poet, and scholar. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighted down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the hopeless find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never again occur. 
May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and the people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Thank you so much for letting me join and I wish the best opportunity uh, for raising the Lotus event and tremendous success. Thank you. We will be chanting the uh, name of the Bodhisattva of Universal Compassion, which in uh, Sino-Korean is Kwan Se Um Bo Sao. Uh, Kwan means perceive, Se Um means world, and uh, Se Um means uh, uh, sound. So perceive the sounds of the world is the Bodhisattva of great compassion. So we chant uh, her name uh, to invoke the energy of universal compassion and to spread it widely uh, throughout the, the universe. So we'll chant this for a few minutes. Manhattan One Buddhist Temple. So my particular tradition, it's called One Buddhism, W-O-N, that uh, literally means a circle in Korean. Um, first of all, I'm very, of course, uh, honored and happy to join you all today that as we offer from the Buddhist Council of New York, the annual Meditate NYC program. Um, I personally grew up in Korea. I met this practice in Korea and had training. And I moved to the States. That was 2008. Now I see it's been a long time that I came here to serve uh, our community here. And I am very blessed to meet all the Buddhist teachers, um, Buddhist brothers and sisters that I'm fortunate enough to meet you all in this circle. And, uh, Having this time to share our practice, I feel extremely blessed. Today, I thought that I could share a sh short uh, message from the one Buddhist uh, founding master called uh, Sotesan. I'd like to share his words here. It says, as for practical application of the Buddha Dharma, it means we should not, as in the past, be incapable of handling worldly affairs because of being attached to the Buddha Dharma, but instead be able to handle worldly affairs even better because of being disciples of the Buddha. In other words, our aim is that we should not be useless in the world by being Buddhist practitioners but through our practical application of the Buddha Dharma, we become useful people who can help individuals, families, and societies, and nations. 
this I thought um, well kind of represent one Buddhist uh, idea in the practice, emphasizing the practical application of Buddha Dharma. And I see from, of course, from other Buddhist teachers and teachings, emphasizing that for us to have this practice, how we can really uh, make this life more wholesome, um, more useful for, for ourselves as an individual, but also how we can make this Buddhist teaching and practice to help uh, the world. That's what we have heard so far from, from the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi and uh, Enkyo O'Hara. So that was, I guess, this emphasis on practical application of Buddha Dharma was the kind of first click for me to find this Buddhist practice uh, very attractive because I truly understand that for me to have happy, peaceful life, I realize that you know it's it's not really about me, but we I need to learn. I need to uh, learn how to understand the reality and how I can help others as well. So this is why I would like to share this. And through the practice of what we call the threefold trainings, through the practice of cultivating the still, calm, clear mind through meditation practice. And we cultivate the wisdom and through our practice of ethical conduct, which means that wholesome actions through our words, through our thoughts, through our deeds. So by having this practice of wisdom, compassion, that we can ultimately understand the nature of reality and be a better person to serve ourselves and to the community. I hope, um, I know many of you already found this path and maybe for those who are watching this later in searching uh, in this spiritual cultivation, I hope you go further to see what's available out there. And as you find the particular teachings and teachers, and once we found this path, I guess the next step, the only thing we need to do is continuing this practice. I would like to uh, end my sharing with a short prayer um, offering here. May we all take refuge in Dharma and be filled with compassion and wisdom. May we transform delusion into wisdom, greed into generosity, resentment into gratitude, discord into harmony, and hatred into compassion. In this time of division and confusion, may our hearts join in solidarity to heal the wounds of division and to unite us by realizing that we are all interrelated. May we look deeply within ourselves to become one with the Dharma and to defeat all the darkness and ignorance in our mind and in our society. May we continue this practice. Thank you all for listening. Well, my name is Chinyo Atkinson. I'm a Soho Zen Buddhist priest, ordained since 2007. I received ordination and Dharma transmission from my teacher, Reverend Tejo Munich, and was a resident of Great Tree Zen Te Women's Temple from 2010 until 2020. I currently reside in the Bronx. Thank you for um, allowing me to speak today. I served as Tenso or cook at my temple great tree for a number of years. For a time, I was really into making vegetarian soup stock and from kitchen scraps. I'd read somewhere how kitchen workers in the past could be dismissed or at the very least have their wages garnished if they threw away the precious scraps, even in the richest of households. They knew what we fail to remember these days in these days of wastefulness that valuable nutrition and flavor 
the hard stems and skins and ugly ends of vegetables hold, how they can deepen and broaden the taste of a soup and impart health and vitality to those who are fed. What makes a soup delicious? What gives the body mind vitality? What provides the clarity and strength needed to walk the eightfold path? What feeds the lotus? Delusion makes it difficult to recognize the abundance of our lives. Judgment based on limited perception and intellect sometimes causes me to reject that which would make my way more fulfilling and interesting. Note please that I did not say it would make my way easier. As with soup stocks made of scraps, the ingredients of our lives may change daily depending upon what's available. One day the stock may come out sweet, the next bitter. One day everything goes our way, the next it's all taken away. Each day we learn to adjust, to deal with the reality that's before us and to add a little more salt, a little more sugar from our stores or simply experience our reality and variety without judgment. We come to understand that every day we take the sweet and bitter nutrients of the Dharma and the body of the Buddha continues to manifest. Distaste for the scraps is suffering. I try to ignore, devalue, and throw away parts of the universe that are meant to nurture me in ways that I can't yet understand. The lotus grows from a murky soup. Its roots feed from the smelly mash of lives long past, minerals scoured from crumbling mountainsides, moldy bits and pieces of a world continuously transforming. Undeniably, the beauty of the lotus blooms from this mud. No mud, no lotus. I try my best not to waste the month of this life. I try to remember to drink deep from the dark pot with gratitude. In the Tenzo Kyokun, Dogen gives us this recipe. Take one stalk of vegetable to make the six foot body of Buddha. Invite the six foot body to make one stalk of vegetable. This is the divine power that causes transformation and the Buddha work that benefits beings. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. I'm Tom Kaz Hatakeyama, Minister of Risho Kosekai of New York. Today I'm very honored to participate in this program. First of all, I like to pray from my heart that those who have, who have lost their precious lives by COVID-19 may rest in peace. And those who are presently receiving treatments in the hospitals and those who are recovering in their homes, I pray for your speedy recovery. On the occasion of today's program, I'd like to introduce late Dr. Murakami, who was Professor Emeritus at the University of Tsukuba in Japan. He passed away in April of this year. As Dr. Murakami did his research in his life, life science, he started to realize the mystery and the wonder of life and said to the following, people easily say, we are alive, but there is not one person on earth who is alive with only one's own power. Whether it be breathing or our blood circulation, it is not by our own device that they work, but it, it is because things like the automatic nervous system actively participate that were able to live. Wherein Dr. Murakami calls what enables that magnificent harmony as something great, saying, we must not forget to have gratitude for this gift. Human body has nearly 100 trillion cells, and with, within each and every cell, there are nucleus and the genes are found within the nucleus. 
If genes are not working, we'd immediately die. The understanding of human genes is still marginal. But present research sees only 5% are actually working, with many genes remaining in the off state. Thus, Dr. Murakami speculated that within the genes not yet known, there might be guns that uh, respond strongly with the mind, that will gui uh, guide people to successful lives and make them feel happy. With such hypothesis, Dr. Murakami is saying, when human beings are always positive and full of energy, everything will go well. The state of mind at, at sweet, uh, such times have the ability to own, own the good genes and to turn off the bad genes. Although we do not yet know the mechanics for that, I think meaning of the recent popular concept of being positive can be said to be within this idea. This is short introduction of Dr. Murakami's work. He was planning to visit the United States and uh, have lectures in many places at last year. Due to the COVID-19 situation, his plan of visiting the United States was postponed. However, uh, unfortunately, he passed away this year. I'd like to pray that he may rest in peace. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Mamu myo ho lenge kyo. Sorry, sorry. A Prayer for Our Natural Environment by Venerable Master Xing Yun, the founder of Fu Guangshan. O oh, great compassionate Buddha, we would like to tell you of an unjust situation on our mind. The world that we live in has been ruined and fallen ill. Flowers are no longer emitting fragrance. Birds are no longer singing. The green mountains are no longer smiling. The flowing water is no longer crystal clear. Please look. Excessive logging has stripped vast areas of vegetation. Exhaust pollution has tainted the beautiful and delicate appearance of our mountains and rivers. The once lush forests have now become the houses and mansions of people, taking away the only sanctuary of many species. The only crystal clear lakes have now been polluted everywhere, and the once leaping marine species can now no longer move freely our natural resources have been decreasing sharply day by day. How will future generations survive? The air that we breathe is not clean. Our health has been threatened. O oh, great compassionate Buddha, we have five sense organs, eyes, ears, nose, tongue and body. We have five poisons, greed, anger, ignorance, arrogance, and doubt. We are on the verge of destroying our beautiful earth and disintegrating the ecological relations of nature. Too many rare birds and animals have disappeared into humankind's mills and mounds. Too many dainties of land and sea have gone missing under humankind's guns and knives. O oh, great compassionate Buddha, please let us and our future generations 
be able to play with fireflies under the radiance of star-brimmed skies. Be able to sing and dance with great nature on the shore of an emerald sea. Be able to enjoy fresh air in the thick forests of towering trees. And be able to grow together with all things under the sun on a field that extends out far beyond the horizon. This is not just for the natural environment, but also for the hometowns of humankind. This is not just for the Earth's existence, but also for our future generations. Please grant us tender hands to soothe all sentient beings on Earth. Please grant us ears that listen attentively to the wondrous sounds of the world and natural phenomena. Please grant us bright and keen eyes to discover the limitless treasures of the universe. Please grant us compassionate hearts to preserve the ecology of our world. O oh, great compassionate Buddha, we can no longer allow mountains and rivers to be tainted. We can no longer allow the earth to weep. We can no longer allow living beings to be frightened. We can no longer allow the air to be polluted. We must strive to let mountains and rivers be splendorous and green again. We must strive to let the beauty of the earth reappear. We must strive to restore fragrant fresh air. We must strive to let nature become a solemn pure land again. O oh, great compassionate Buddha, Please accept our heartfelt prayer. O great compassionate Buddha, please accept our heartfelt prayer. Namo Sakyamuni Buddha. Yeah.
meditation. The clear waters range to the vast blue autumn sky. How can they compare with the hazy moon on a spring night? Many people want to have pure clarity. But sweep as you will, you cannot empty the mind. Kaizen Zenji. I trust when you're not awake, you're not awake. Waking up to sufferings of people who are different from us is a long process and has a whole lot to do with what community we belong to and whose consciousness and life experiences impact our own on a daily basis. I have a hunch I'm going to be waking up until the moment I die. Let us forever remember the causes of suffering. Let us forever act to end suffering. May we always have the courage to bear witness, to see ourselves as other and other as ourselves. May penetrating light dispel the darkness of ignorance. Let all calmer be resolved and the mind flower bloom in eternal spring. May we all ascend to enlightenment, great peace and love, and let us vow to feed the hungry spirits together. I think we are to see um, a presentation now from Greg Snyder. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I want to thank James and the Buddhist Council for inviting me to speak today. I think what's on my heart to talk about is um, is Sangha. One of the questions, we're currently in a practice period with the Brooklyn Zen Center, and one of the questions we're asking is, how does Sangha, or I guess we would say, how do we meet the world as Sangha? And meeting the world is the world that's right now, the world that is this pandemic, the world that has um, seen uprisings around racial violence, the world that has um, that is making even clearer the economic imbalances of the world, things like the 37 million people who are in poverty in our country, the 13 million children who are in food insecure homes. the two million who are in prison, the threats to our immigrant communities, those who are enslaved in the world, some put those numbers at 27 million, many of them victims of human trafficking and sex trafficking, the racialized violence that's a part of all of this. And then there's our ecological situation, the loss of thousands of species annually, and governments that are not doing enough to, to turn around our larger social and cultural habits. And so how do we, how do we as a Sangha in our time, how do we as those trained in the Buddha Dharma, those ordained in the Buddha Dharma, how do we meet this world? And it brings up questions both in my role at um, Union Theological Seminary and my role at Brooklyn Zen Center, it brings up questions about what that training looks like and how we prepare people for a world that is, is difficult. And, and it's not a world to be hopeless around, um, but a world that is profoundly challenging. I mean, the Buddha has said to us that a mark of human existence would be dukkha, that it would be suffering. And so that's a compassionate teaching so that, so that our hearts can accept this, that our hearts stop 
resisting and being averse to the pain of the world, but actually open up to it and begin to be able to metabolize it. I actually don't think the teaching of Dukkha is one that is in any way pessimistic. It's one that's realistic and loving and supporting us and opening to the way the world is. And once we can open to that, we can start seeing the ways that we add to it, seeing the ways that we might skillfully respond compassionately so that we can transform it, so that we can meet each painful situation with wisdom and love. So how do we do that in this in this generation? And I, and I don't, and in this time, I don't have um, clear answers to any of this. I do think some of the questions are clear though. I do think we are looking at a world that is presenting clear questions to Buddhist practitioners, to Buddhist Sanghas, if we're willing to um, open to those questions, to let them be in our bodies, to respond to them. And um, I'm always a little, uh, reticent to say that there are clear answers that cover all situations, but but I very much believe that our Buddhist training is one to one of opening our body to clear questions. And so I guess I think of in this time there's this there's in 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 the Chinese tradition that affects the that affects Chan and Zen Buddhism so deeply. There is this. Um, there's this way of talking about and the way you could talk about Buddhist tradition or Zen Buddhist tradition through the metaphor of what's often called the three friends or the three winter friends. And um, that's the pine tree, bamboo, and the plum tree. And the pine tree, we could say, is the representation of the strength of a tradition. It's old, it's tall. It's a towering trunk. It stands on the, on the edge of the mountain line. We can see it from a distance. It's that which reminds us of, of the importance of grounding ourselves in, in the training of our tradition. Bam, and, and all of these are together because they survive winter. The bamboo is um, light, spreads quickly. It's jointed and hollow in the middle. So you could say it's empty at the center. And the joints are um, represent, representative of the way that the tradition is handed to each next generation, each one growing to the next joint and responding quickly um, and broadly to the time. And keeping in mind winter, difficult times. And then finally, the plum tree, which survives the winter, but bears fruit immediately at its end and, and, and um, is the beginning of spring, you might say. And so there's this strong old tradition. There is every generation that has to meet with skillfulness without clinging to some sort of essence of a tradition, the bamboo. And then there is the, there is the tree that is surviving that is going to bear fruit in this time. And um, how do our sanghas turn toward injustice and turn in, turn toward hunger and racism and misogyny and incarceration and the many concrete violences of our current economic system. To deepen our training and to understand what that is and to ask what that is. Um, to feel into the strength of our ancestors, but also open into uh, Dharma that can speak to this moment, that can respond to this moment. I appreciate um, something Bhikkhu Bodhi said in a guided meditation at the closing of, a, of an event a few weeks ago where he asked us to feel in our meta practice, the, um, and really it was a practice that brought together all the Brahma Viharas that there is a hungry child that requires our compassion. And there is 
a response to feeding that child and then to feel the mother, the mother's joy at the moment of knowing that her child is um, now supported with regular food and can go to school with a full stomach instead of a hungry stomach and what that must feel like for the mother and for us to allow ourselves to feel through that entire situation so that we begin to transform and um, in a way remember with our hearts what's real in the world what's happening not from a place of of um, destitution depression despair but from one where our heart reaches out to the suffering and does what's possible. What we often say in Zen is an appropriate response. A, a life well lived is a life of appropriate response to the suffering that's happening in the world. And um, to really ask what Sangha is in this moment in that way. To accept dukkha to the point that an expectation of comfort falls away, doesn't turn us away from our bodhisattva vow to relieve the suffering of the world, but doesn't assume dukkha to the point that we dull ourselves to that compassion, that we don't become cynical. We don't simply say, this is the human world and turn away, but let our heart open to the acceptance of dukkha so that our heart immediately responds to all of these things that are happening. And I believe that we can only do this as a sangha, as sanghas together. And I just wanna say that I'm deeply appreciative of the work that the Buddhist council is doing, that James as its president is doing in knitting together our sanghas. Because I do believe that Together, we are going to be stronger in responding to the world from compassion, from the Buddha Dharma, to each other, to each other's communities, and as communities to the world, to respond to the world as Sangha, and open our hearts to the pain that we need to feel in order to be a part of the loving transformation of suffering into compassion and love, from karma into karana. I think that's enough. I appreciate you um, listening and I look forward to being with you as we emerge out of this pandemic and at least out of its more serious moments, its more dire moments into, um, into an ongoing friendship where we can work together to, to meet suffering with joy and love. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Reverend Dr. TK Nakagaki. <clears throat> so I'm actually the uh, President Emeritus of the Buddhist Council of New York. So as the opposition, I, first of all, I would like to thank for everyone to joining us today, uh, this uh, Meditate NYC, Raising the Lotus. And uh, thank you for all the speakers and um, also committee organized the Meditate NYC this year by the leadership of James Lynch, the president of the Buddhist Council of New York. And uh, myself, I would like to also share some thoughts from uh, my tradition, which is uh, Jodo Shinshu, uh, Pure Land Buddhism uh, developed in Japan, which is, of course, a Mahayana tradition. But then the focus on the primal vow of Amitabha, Amida Buddha, the Buddha of inconceivable light and the inconceivable life. And again, it is a Mahayana tradition of Buddhism. And um, so for me, you know, there's such uh, difficult conditions that we are facing. And um, but it always seems to me there is something centralized ourselves. And uh, whatever the conditions we may be, we always keep 
like as a Mahayana parts, is the four great vows, the uh, just uh, the 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 former speaker just mentioned it, the four noble I mean sort of four great vows, uh, like may all beings be free from suffering, and may all blind passions be dispelled, and may we all learn the Dharma everything of the truth and may all attain the enlightenment so those are kind of four minds that we always keep in our mind as a practitioner of uh, buddhism and uh, the, together mahayana also have uh, six paramitas which is something that we can each practice even like a difficult time you know we have a mindset for four great vows then we can do something, act accordingly. And the first six paramita is a dana, dana paramita, which is like generosity, just simply giving. So giving uh, uh, or benefit to others so that do something with the action that you can do. You have body, you have words, you have thinking, you can offer something with using that. And second part is a shila, Shira paramita, which is um, more like a, you know, uh, disciplines, you can say, or the pre uh, precepts, basically. So the, you try to be the conduct, you know, how you live in this time of uh, pandemic, you try to be still, try not to keep, I mean, I mean, try to keep the precepts, do not kill, simply, do not steal, or do not tell lying, do, do you have uh, healthy conducts and you know uh, different other precepts that you can follow too so that we can keep the wholesome life whatever the all around and then the third one is a kshanti paramita i think the kshanti is something a little bit less miss seems like sometimes missing in the united states or i don't know western country which is patient be patient you know, sometimes it seems like a society itself is a little less patient. You know, of course, the pandemic was supposed to be quick, quickly resolved, but it's not. But then be patient. And then, you know, why do we have to get angry so easily because of that conditions? And then this is a time for patience, really. We can practice patience at this time or tolerance or endurance. You know, those are very important. And uh, so not just frustrate yourself but also others and including all those things and then fourth is a uh, uh, virya uh, paramita which is making efforts basically and so the, diligently we do things and uh, so so but of, of course each one has a limited capacity but yet you just try to do the best that we can and the fifth one is a uh, jhana or dhyana uh, paramita uh, so which is basically the concentration um, or contemplation or meditation or simply you know mindfulness and all those things so that our mind is always calm not excited and so forth it's keeping the calmness and then sixth one is a prajna paramita um, which is a wisdom and uh, insight you can say but it's basically try to understand what is the truth and always keep the truth, as I guess the big body mentioned about the so many, you know, the things around here, uh, misinformation, but the inf some of the informations are not really based upon the truth and create a lot of delusion and the confusion too. So the, so the wisdom is something that we really need to have, uh, right wisdom. So, so these are something that we can do you know, in an individual base, but then that certainly affects to all around since we're talking about interconnectedness. So whatever we do is going to be effect. But uh, today also I'm representing Hewa Foundation or Hewa Peace and Reconciliation Foundation of New York. It's a little long name, so it's always a little hard to pronounce everything, but um, uh, but this one is basically Hewa, that's a Japanese word, and then Hewa basically means peace but then hey is really like an inner peace and then wa is more like an outer peace 
And uh, so inner peace is based upon he, the equality. So see the value of all the life equally. And then the wa is the kind of a, like a dialogue, conversation. So it's like connected to the others. So in a way, uh, for me, one of the reasons that I create this uh, Heva Foundation is uh, the all those things that we talk about, four great vows or six paramitas. For me, like somehow Buddhism comes to give me the, uh, uh, what do you call it, base of uh, peace, peace building. So by practicing the Buddhism, actually we can cr create a peaceful life, peaceful mind, life, and so forth. And so I feel that uh, this Hewa is uh, something very connected to the Buddhism. And so, and also plus this one, as I say, inner peace and outer peace. So we can emphasize both, you know, inner practice as well as outer. So the uh, society, you know, the world that we're living. And so we could be very um, responsible for our own life as well as our own society. So that's the part of the Hero Foundation that I basically started. And then, uh, so in a way, Buddha Dharma is uh, really the base of uh, what kind of spiritual foundation of the Hewa Foundation. So, um, so anyway, so that's something that I would like to share today. And uh, the con considering all the you know condition that we have, we can always start thinking of even dana paramita, not just the individual base, but also so the society. What is the society generosity of society? What kind of you know society we should be giving? You know, kind of giving society is wonderful, but we're taking society sometimes. And then second for shira, you know, like precepts society. So everything is people not killing each other, stealing each other, nothing like that then that would be something also that we wanted to focus on, the kshanti, tolerance, patience. Yeah. And so so we, I just mentioned a little bit before, so this yeah. society could be a more patient society. And virya society, which is people making efforts to the best that they can. And so that yeah. kind of, a, you know, the positive society would be very wonderful. And the jhana society, so could be, you know, really meditative, you know, everybody's uh, coming and um, so that we can listen to each other too, actually, because of that. And then prajna and the society itself with a wise, with, you know, sharing all the wisdom and then, the, you know, creating the um, society, which really have a base on the truth of the wisdom. So anyway, so those are some of the thoughts that I have on this occasion. And so I would like to offer the very lastly, the four great vows since I talk about. It. And uh, so that's the uh, offering for the people uh, who are gone uh, this time. And also one of the reasons I put the, the uh, Buddha picture here is also kind of related. Amitabha is considered, uh, the Buddha Amitabha is considered one of the most compassionate Buddhas. So I would like to uh, use this one for today. And um, let me just cover and join me in meditation and Sentient beings are numberless, I vow to save them. Desires are endless, I vow to end them. The gate of Dharma is boundless, I vow to master it. The Buddha way is supreme, I vow to attain it. Namo Amida. Namo Amida.
Sadhu, Thank, Thank you. you. Look, Sylvie, would you like to say a few words about uh, our organization for the... <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a really uh, very meaningful, inspiring, amazing program. Uh, I have a deep uh, infection. Okay. To think about how I connected to Buddhist uh, Council of New York. This is a back to way when uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi invited me to be a board member and fundraising chair for Buddhist uh, global relief. Many do the hunger relief, chronical hunger and malnutrition to take that uh, uh, big project. I started and actually Bante uh, and I was suggesting to have a fundraising at the beginning in New York City to have an event. That is how I first connected to Buddhist Council of New York. Uh, I remember the first uh, walk to walk to feed the hungry when we back to 2010 or 2011. Uh, in order to promote it, of course, we thinking about the Buddhist community. Where is the best uh, way to do it or best organization is the Buddhist Council of New York. Uh, the first uh, event I went to uh, with Bante is uh, in, I think it's uh, Washington Square, Washington Square in Lower Manhattan, the Jackson High, uh, Jackson Memorial Church, right? Back to long time ago, Meditate NYC. So I was there and uh, with receiving tremendous uh, uh, help and special treatment. Right away, we were invited to join the uh, monthly meeting. And then before, before we become uh, join the meeting, then we have to become a member. So let's talk about member, <laughs> what we can, uh, my experience that not only we try to donate or uh, pay the mem membership that time. But instead of that uh, meeting, the council's meeting uh, decided to double the, double the membership and donate back to Buddhist, uh, Buddhist Global Relief. Since then, always uh, every year, so thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, this is how I feel about the Buddhist Council of New York. And I like to, uh, as a committee of the membership, I invited and encourage everybody, individual organization, come to Buddhist Council of New York because not only you donate, you also share, you give and you receive from the community. Uh, since then, we have uh, 11 years uh, since right now. We, Buddhist uh, Global Relief, was uh, growing from the first year, 30,000 donation to this year's, uh, I think we'll hit the million dollars. Uh, can you imagine every penny, every dollar go to feed the hunger, give it to the opportunity of a young girl uh, often to have opportunity to go to school and environment, uh, agriculture friendly methods, all this all because of uh, from the very little $1 or even not a dollar, just come to help the volunteer. Exactly when you want to do something, no matter you are Buddhist or not, join as an individual to Buddhist Council of New York. If you need help, we're gonna help you. If you want to help, please connect with us. Connect with Buddhist Council of New York for donating your time, your, your creativity. We need you to be connect to us. And thank you so much. Please don't forget to make the connection and make the donation and ask if you need any help to Buddhist Council of New York and info at 
Buddhist Council of New York. That all. Thank you so much. Thank you. We hadn't decided how to do it, but I'm going to ring three bells, and that will be the closing of the event. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a beautiful day. Stay out of the rain. <laughs> it's pouring outside. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, bye. And we're gonna, this is going to be on the videotape later on. This is going to be a videotape. You'll be able to see it later as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so. you.